Coming up, a conversation with Catherine Cat Gale, candidate for Colorado Springs at large city councilor. This is 6035 Media. Casting an informed vote is your right and your duty as a citizen. I'm Brian Grossman, executive editor of 6035. And I'm Shelley Rohr, spokesperson for the League of Women Voters of the Pikes Peak region. We're teaming up to bring you conversations with the candidates in the April 2023 Colorado Springs City election. So this interview is both an episode of the new 6035 Vote podcast. And the League's Making Democracy Work podcast. So let's get to it. Kat, why don't you go ahead and get us started and tell us a little bit about yourself for a couple minutes. So I'm almost a Colorado native. We moved to Loveland, Colorado on my second birthday when my dad started a job at Colorado State University. He was a summer ranger in Yellowstone National Park, so I spent summers in a log cabin when there were still grizzly bears. Mm -hmm. I thought that I needed to get as far away from Colorado State University as possible, so I went to college in Massachusetts. I guess there were colleges in Maine, but I didn't look at those. (laughs) And then I went to law school in Washington, D.C., Met my husband on an airplane, which should have been a sign because he became a foreign service officer. And then I spent the next 30 years mostly overseas. We ended up in Colorado Springs. He was the diplomat in residence at the Air Force Academy, which means the State Department paid his salary and he taught poli sci. And we bought a house here. And then after our last tour in Haiti, we came back here so my youngest son could go to high school in one place. And so we moved back into the house, and here we are. Awesome. Thank you for your service, too, as well to our – that's a hard job being on that other side of it, so thank you. <laughs> when did you move back to Colorado Springs? Um, 2015. 2015, okay. Uh, oh, no, 2017, sorry. That's all right. Um, somewhere in there, right? Yeah. Uh, so my first question has to do with uh, water and development. Uh, Colorado Springs City Council recently adopted the 128% water rule. This was uh, last week, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is for extending water and other util- utilities to flagpole annex developments. What's your stance on the 128% water rule and annexation? I think 128% is arbitrary, as would have been the 130 that they tried originally to pass. Mm -hmm. But I do think it's important that we think about water and conservation in every development annexation decision. The problem is, as I started digging, it seems that that law was put forth by developers saying, oh, look, Banning Lewis Ranch is the only area still to be developed within Colorado Springs City. And so I'm not sure how much of that decision and that law was actually for water conservation, water responsibility, as opposed to shenanigans. And so one of my main points as a candidate is transparency and fair process in city planning and in the city council decisions. Okay, thank you. Shelley? Um, so also kind of another water question, because it's a big issue um, for us. Uh, they, we waste a lot of water. Landscaping takes about 78% of our water usage, whether it's your next door neighbor planting a non-native grass, Kentucky bluegrass, or golf courses, resorts with their luscious green greenness that, you know, I'm a real estate agent. I know curb appeal. So <laughs> what's maybe another way we could do better here in this aspect with that? And then also... As a, you know, being part of a regional water provider that we are in the Colorado Springs utilities, should the city consider extending water and or other utilities to subdivisions located outside the city that might never be annexed? I think every decision needs to be made on a case-by-case basis. That's another problem with the 128%. Right now we're in a drought. Maybe next year we'll have a flood. Maybe there will be greater demands from California or fewer demands from California on the Colorado River, which is the source of So many waters, I think seven states are Mm -hmm. all relying on the Colorado River Basin. And so if California is able to keep the deluge that they're getting now, maybe that will ease up water for us. But it has to be on a case-by-case basis because no one can predict the weather. And water is a finite resource. We need the water cycle, but the more we develop, the more we impede the water from going in to the soil, into the groundwater, into the aquifer, and then having the water cycle up and around like we used to teach first graders. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think we need to be very careful with sending water 
beyond our borders. I believe it's Phoenix. I was just reading about how the city of Phoenix has shut off water to the suburbs. Mm. Because they just said, oh, we don't have enough, and you're not within our city limits. So your swimming pools and your rolling lawns are not going to get water now. And I don't want us ever to be in a situation like that. I don't think it's responsible if we say we'll provide water and then we don't. I know like Black Forest gets their water from, I think it's called Cherokee. Mm -hmm. This is all, I've only been a candidate for three weeks. (laughs) So (laughs) I have a lot more research to do. But back to conservation, when my husband was a foreign service officer, when we lived in the United States, we lived in the DC area and our next door neighbors, the man was a city planner for Arlington, Virginia. And he actually came to Colorado Springs because our Xeriscape gardens and our plans for water conservation and native species were leading in the entire United States. And so I think that we need to look to our Colorado Springs Xeriscape gardens and say, what can we do? It's not just a matter of pouring red rocks across the lawn because that actually is not as helpful as one would think because that, again, impedes the water cycle and it mm-hmm. raises the temperature. But if we could plant buffalo grass and maybe more succulents and have some rocks and just native species and say goodbye to those beautiful blossoming trees of New England. Mm-hmm. Very good. Thank you, babe. Can I just follow up on that? Would you do this? Would you encourage water con- conservation or would it be something that you would pursue through an ordinance? Good because question. you will be involved with utilities too as, yes. as a city councilor. So I guess wearing both hats, how would you how would you approach that? I'm trying to think of a way, and again, I have to get more into the law, mm-hmm. to incentivize water conservation as well as other limits and things. So if somebody were willing to rip up their Kentucky bluegrass lawn and put in buffalo grass, is there a way we could make that more affordable? Mm-hmm. Because I was looking at even the patch between my sidewalk and the street, and just to roll that up and put in gravel was going to be over a thousand dollars. Like, who? I can pay for a lot of water for that thousand dollars, but I don't want to just pay for the water because we all must do our part to conserve. And you also have the issue of people conserving. Then it seems that there is more water available for the developers to extend beyond the boundaries into annex. So Mm -hmm. any water that we conserve, I think, should be left within the city as opposed to say, oh, look, we've lessened the demand by 10%, so therefore that's 10% more that we can sprawl. Okay. Uh, A personal property rights question. Where do you stand on accessory dwelling units being allowed in single-family residential areas? I'm not sure what an accessory dwelling unit is. Uh, if somebody were to build a smaller, like a like a like mother-in-law's a mother-in-law. cottage, ah, okay. or and to be used either commercially or you know a lot of people use them for Airbnbs, um, but there is the argument that extended families could live there and that sort of thing. So, I think you'd have to consider the character of the neighborhood where it is. I mean, a lot of downtown, we have accessory dwelling units that were the tuberculosis houses or the tuberculosis porches. And as costs of accommodation go up and up, it seems that we do need to allow extended families. I mean, right now, my daughter is living with my father because she can't afford her own house at $20 $20 an hour pay, which $20 an hour sounds like an awful lot compared to my $3 an hour when I was in high school. But when you stack that against an efficiency apartment is $1,200 or $1,500, mm-hmm. she lives with my dad. In the house or in a separate? In the house in the in basement. The, in the house, okay. But I could see in a different configuration mm-hmm. that that way she could have her privacy and it would be workable. So you support uh, homeowners – Right, we'll say to to build. On Again, their, I would on say on a case by case basis, okay. because we have problems like on the west side. Every time there's an open space, we say, "Ooh, let's do high density housing mm-hmm. units," which theoretically is great. But the west side already had a difficult time getting out from the Waldo Canyon fire, mm-hmm. and there's you know potentially other natural disasters, and so if you're putting these accessory dwelling units. That's one or two more cars. 
into streets that are already clogged. Right. And I live on the north side of Colorado Springs, and we had a small grass fire outside of the Great Wolf Lodge, and Voyager was at a standstill, and I-25 was mm -hmm. at a standstill. So people who were trying to get out from the fire couldn't get out. First responders couldn't get in to fight the fire. And so it was just a disaster. So putting any more dwelling units that would have that many more cars, I think would be a mistake. So we really, I think we need to build out the infrastructure before we do too much building where there already is. And when you say, uh Oh, I lost my train of thought, so I'm going to skip that. Go ahead, Shelley. <laughs> <laughs> um, so another housing question, right? You mentioned it with your daughter. I mean, what are some plans to address the city's affordable housing issue, you know, attainability, right? Because it's not just about the crisis. There is a crisis, but it's, it's not attainable for some, even with a $20 an hour salary. What yeah. do we do about that? Well, I was told because I'm asking everyone I meet, everyone I know from all sides of the political spectrum, like, what are the issues in Colorado Springs now? Because I'm really new to the issues. Um, attainable does not mean affordable, I would say. Attainable is someone, I think, a household income. So that's the entire household, not an individual salary, is $80,000 for a $300,000 house. Right. And that eliminates most of the people in Colorado Springs that just on a per capita basis, when we have a tourist-based economy, most people in this town are hourly wage earners, minimum wage or slightly more, $20 an hour. And so what then is affordable for them is a whole different thing even than attainable. And I was looking at the statistics. The greatest growth we have in Colorado Springs now are senior citizens and millennials. And so we need to capture some kind of a market for those people. So with senior citizens, I think we need to look more at universal design of housing. And I think when we're having these new developments, the universal design needs to be incorporated to at least some of the units. And that would be for people with mobility issues, for sensory issues so that they can have a roll-in front porch, so that their parts of the kitchen have a lower counter, so that there's at least one roll-in shower room in the house. And also for millennials, when you have a house like that, it enables you to grow into the house as a family. It enables people to age in place. And so all of those things in the end would keep costs down. I know we came back to the United States because my mother was diagnosed with ALS. And in order to retrofit our house for her to have a ramp into the front door and to have a shower she could roll in was almost $40,000. And if you just put that design concept at the front end, it would be more because right now a door is a set thing and so you can go to Home Depot or Lowe's or any other place and get that set standard door and so they'll have to have bigger doors and so that would cost more at the onset but I can't imagine it costing thirty or forty thousand dollars if you build a house new with that in place. Um, also as far as affordable housing goes I was looking at neighborhoods because this is something as you were talking about you know building auxiliary housing or accessory housing mm -hmm. um, there's an area, it's a neighborhood called Mill Street that's round at the base of the Drake Power Plant. Mm -hmm. So the Drake Power Plant is closed. And as soon as it closed, speculators came in and they started buying some of the houses. Well, they're free to do that. But as soon as they bought those houses, they turned them into Airbnbs. Mm -hmm. So when it's an Airbnb, the people who live there can't afford to rent it. An Airbnb doesn't house a family. And if you're investing in that property, that means whatever happens once Drake is removed, they don't have a vested interest in keeping that housing unit residence intact mm -hmm. to be part of that neighborhood. And Mill Street, that was our working class neighborhood. And so if a redevelopment of the Drake area drives them out, where will they go? And already a good chunk of that neighborhood was driven out when Drake expanded. So they're clinging to their identity as it is. They're working now to do a CBA, which I can't remember what it stands for, but it's an agreement of the community. So whoever gets that 42 acres of land, which is prime real estate on Monument Creek, 
right downtown, Mm -hmm. that hopefully they'll build a community center or something that maybe they can have an art space or a senior room so that the seniors in that area can meet for cards or coffee or have child care programs for kids, maybe a community garden, some kind of green space so that that neighborhood of affordable housing is retained and the affordability of that housing is protected. And also part of it would be whatever is developed in that area, a certain portion of the residents of the area could either have the jobs, one, building it, two, working in it, or three, if they lack the training to have whatever jobs are necessary, whatever they develop there, provide the developer could provide the training for those people so that they wouldn't be priced out and pushed out of their own neighborhood. Thank you very much. I'm glad you brought up accessory dwelling units because it made me remember my follow-up question. And it's a real quick one before we move on. So you said case by case basis when determining, you know, which neighbor were you talking when you say case by case, do you mean by neighborhood or do you mean by individual property? A little of both. Is it possible to take each individual property and consider that on its own? Is that efficient? It's definitely not efficient. (laughs) (laughs) Just some neighborhoods, there is a larger lot Mm -hmm. for that house, and maybe that house would have its own egress point behind into an alley where another house might not have that. So I think you'd have to adapt the code to say in houses with X number of square feet where there would be a secondary egress point, Mm -hmm. we could do it. So So you're in favor of an overall rule by neighborhood and then considering if somebody doesn't fit within that rule and they want to do an ADU, they could appeal. um, Does that make sense? A neighborhood might be too general because a house that's on a corner could potentially have two exit points, whereas a house in the middle of the block would only have one. And so, again, I'm really, really concerned about the infrastructure and fire Mm -hmm. and first responder access to people and for people to get out of whatever the situation is. Okay. Okay. So it's not so much as being against the accessory dwelling. It's about the potential burden Mm -hmm. that having a lot of accessory dwellings would have in a fixed space. Okay. But there should be some sort of broader guidelines and then... I'm just yeah. making sure I understand you correctly. And then Broader people guidelines. could appeal that if they felt they were an exception to the rule. Okay. Exactly. Got it. But exceptions should be exceptional. R- okay. Not just, oh, sure, you're a developer. Sure. Right. That city Because code, I want it doesn't That's count. irrelevant. <laughs> okay. Uh, and you, you mentioned some public safety stuff there, so let's move to that. Uh, Colorado Springs Police Department is short 50 to 70 officers, I guess, depending on when you count them, uh, mm-hmm. from their authorized strength. Uh, what do you do about the shortage of police and sort of the trajectory that the city's taking with crime, traffic crashes, things like that? So that is another situation that there has to be a balance. Mm-hmm. And just going out and saying, okay, we need 70 more policemen, let's get them, that's not enough. Mm-hmm. We want to get good policemen. One of our first problems is our wages for police and first responders across the board are very, very low compared to the rest of the Front Range of Colorado. Mm -hmm. So I would far rather work in Loveland, which is not a high crime area, for a lot more money than to come to Colorado Springs. So we need to do something to enhance a benefit package, higher wages, better benefits, and more community training. Mm -hmm. Because another issue we have in Colorado Springs is the police have kind of moved from a protect and serve model where they're members of the community and you go see officer friendly to help you Mm -hmm. to more of a militaristic we are here in this crisis to stop the bad guy yeah and i absolutely believe in stopping bad guys but if we had more community training i think the policemen would be safer because police also are targets Mm -hmm. And I understand that every time they stop a car, just basic traffic stop, your taillights out, they're probably afraid that the person in that car could pull out a gun and shoot them. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely, sadly, a reasonable fear. And yet, if we worked more in 
whether you had certain officers assigned to a community so they'd know what are typical actions and reactions, and the community could feel that they were on a team. Mm -hmm. So it was going back to protect and serve. Um, an example, when we lived in Virginia, my son was on an ice hockey team, and his coach was a Fairfax County police officer. I was teaching first grade in a Title I school in a public housing project that was full of recent American immigrants. Um, and there were, in the housing project, Vietnamese gangs, El Salvadoran gangs. There was a Muslim community. It's like whatever the patterns of the world were at any given time, mm. they would end up in the Seven Corners, Bailey's Crossroads housing community. But what um, Officer Pang did, he would come in to my first grade class, and there's this book, Officer Buckle and Gloria. And he'd read stories with the kids, and he'd let them touch his badge. And then when we'd go on nature walks or whatever, he'd come by and flash his lights and let the kids climb in and out of the car. And that really helped the kids to know that the police officers weren't just there to take their cousins away mm -hmm. or their parents away, that the police officers were there to protect them. Mm -hmm. And it was really a very, very small but nice bond that they built. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks, Shelley. Well, um, speaking of some jobs that our law enforcement do that they probably shouldn't have, kind of they're overburdened with, with tasks that they need to do. Some They deal with a lot of homeless complaints, homeless issues. They're sent out on those types of calls. Um, how would you address or expand um, our homeless outreach and issues with for the city? I think we really need to take a new look at it. In Utah, they do very well with a program, I think they call it Housing First, and they've been successful at getting almost 90% of the homeless off the streets. We need to come up with the root causes of homelessness, because right now it seems that what our mayor's office is doing is just moving them around. I remember when we first moved here, it was turn off the lights so that the homeless couldn't see downtown. And now there's the ordinance of don't sit or lie down on a sidewalk or in a park. And so that's vaguely enforceable. It clearly is targeting the homeless because somehow I think if I flipped a blanket down in Acacia Park and had a picnic with my kids, they're not going to make me move on. And so we need to have real action rather than pushing them west or pushing them north and just pushing them out of downtown. Homeless are people. They're there for a reason. Great. Thank you. Can I ask your city council pay question? Is now Please. is now an, okay? Oh. <laughs> uh, city councilors don't make a lot of money. Uh, Six thousand two hundred and fifty dollars a year, I think, is the salary. Do you support raising city councilor pay to be able to broaden the the field of uh, potential councilors? I absolutely think so. I think that the city council would do a better job if it were actually their profession mm -hmm. instead of. I mean, it's really an honorarium. Mm. The $6,000 will pay when you're at a council meeting until 7 o'clock at night, and so you take your family out to dinner instead of yeah. cooking something at home. And that's one reason that I'm running, because I'm fortunate that we have enough money that I can dedicate a huge amount of time to doing this job. And most people can't. And so that really limits the voices on the council to people – who are independently wealthy or are in a partnership where one partner can pay the bills and so that I could do that. Okay. So I absolutely believe in that. Other people would say, why pay the city council when they do such a poor job anyway? <laughs> <laughs> and so one hand washes the other, right? Yeah. If you want to get qualified people in who are willing to go through a thousand page development plan to make sure the law is being followed, mm -hmm. pay them. So some of the other candidates uh, that we talked to uh, and asked the same question of they've they've come back with ranges maybe even you know sort of this would be an okay wage do you have anything in mind I think probably around fifty thousand dollars it's a professional job mm -hmm. so it should get a professional salary although the council meetings are 
what is it, every two weeks, and then there's the day of preparation, reading all the documents. Mm -hmm. But I think to be a good council person, especially for someone like me who's running at large, you need to take time to get to know the city. Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't really know about Mill Street until I started thinking about neighborhoods and development and what is development doing. And they Mm -hmm. talk about urban renewal. Well, urban renewal can crush a neighborhood. And so what is blight? And is there a way that you can revive something without destroying it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, we are running low on time, so I think maybe Shelley's next question before we wrap it up will be the last one. Sure. So a pretty simple one. What are your thoughts on moving spring municipal elections to the fall to help increase voter turnout and save the city approximately $600,000 per year? Sounds like a good idea to me. I'm Scottish, so if we can save money... <laughs> save paper on the ballot so we don't have to have two sets of mailing and two sets of everything, two blue books. I don't know if we do blue books for city elections. If you got an issue, right, you, yeah. you would do and the And we have the tops, right? That's mm-hmm. maybe so. you do. So you will have one that yeah. affects your budget. So I'm learning lots of things, and That's I will maybe. continue to learn. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Yeah, we're uh, just about out of time. So if you could take maybe another two minutes and uh, close us out, let us know why we should vote for you. Absolutely. I think the reason you should vote for me is because I'm not beholden to anybody. I'm here to represent Colorado Springs and to make Colorado Springs the best city it can be. I'm not here for a political party. I'm not here for developers. I'm not here for anti-development. I'm here as a mom, as a wife, as someone who's been a lawyer, who's been a teacher, who's been a human rights advocate. And I really think that Colorado Springs has potential to be far better than it is. We have the most beautiful location in all the Front Range. Again, I grew up in Loveland, and we used to come down and watch Peggy Fleming and Dorothy Hamill skate at the Broadmoor before they turned the ice skating into more golf. (laughs) And then we'd have high tea on the terrace, and it was quite lovely. And so I'd like Colorado Springs to be a draw like that and to have a sense of self, a sense of neighborhood, a sense of community like the other cities do on the Front Range. Well, thanks, Kat. We appreciate your time. Uh, You've been watching or listening to a joint podcast effort by 6035 Media and the League of Women Voters of the Pikes Peak Region. Be sure to follow Making Democracy Work and check out lwvppr.org for more information regarding our candidate forums in March. And stick around with us at 6035 Vote to make sure your vote is an informed one. This podcast is produced by Dave Gardner, videos directed by Nick Raven. I'm Brian Grossman, executive editor. And I'm Shelley Rohr, spokesperson for the League of Women Voters of the Pikes Peak region. See you next time. Hi, I'm Dave Gardner. And I'm Nick Raven. We're the podcast producers here at 6035 Media. 6035 Vote is just one of a growing family of hyperlocal podcasts that we're creating. And these are for you, someone who wants to engage fully in your community. We've got the 6035, which is a quick, lively recap of the top news stories of the week. It's my favorite. It's really great and often funny. I love having you as a guest, actually. I do, too. And then we have Hot Takes and Stirring Breaks, which is a potpourri of news and commentary about movies, gaming, TV, streaming, and just so much more. It's for youthful heart and you know, that could be anyone, really. Yeah, I'm surprised I even really enjoy it because Nick hosts that and uh, he's, he's witty. Well, and the cool thing is that you can watch both of these podcasts on YouTube. Or you can listen to them on the go in your favorite podcast app. And there's a couple more, uh, but you can also visit 6035media.org slash podcast to see them, browse them, sample them. And then subscribe to the ones that you like. And then subscribe to this YouTube channel. Yeah. And if you really love it all, like we do, uh, you can just you can just subscribe to the 6035 Podcast Network podcast, which is a conglomeration of all the episodes, all the brilliance and humor that emanates from the studio. Absolutely. And there's a lot of it. So like and subscribe today and go listen to them all or watch them. What he said. Good. Thanks. Got it? That wasn't so painful.